If you're thinking of buying the Pimax Crystal Super, it's currently available with three different optical engines with a fourth OLED option due sometime in the future. In this video I want to address the three optical engine options that are available right now and share my views and opinions with you so if you're unsure of which one to plumb for, hopefully this will help. If you'd like more information on the 50 PPD ultra wide or 57 PPD version, I've done separate reviews of each of the respective modules. Check out those videos, link in the notes below. Welcome back to the Sim Hanger. My name's Mark. Thanks very much for watching and let's get started. A summary of the published specifications for each of the options. They all look pretty standard with the only variants being FOV, but there are other considerations to take into account and some common denominators which we'll deal with first. VR headsets, adaptability and functionality is only often as good as the software that supports it. Pimax Play has come a long way over the last couple of years and now represents a fairly solid and stable environment, supporting both OpenXR and Steam platforms with a variety of resolution and performance enhancement options available within the software itself. All versions of the Pimax Crystal Super feature the smaller form factor in comparison to the Pimax Crystal OG and the Pimax Crystal Lite. All three options can also be considered high-end VR, boasting high resolutions, local dimming and eye tracking, and subsequently require a fair amount of hardware grunt, with the 57 PPD version being the less demanding of the three. The glass aspheric lenses all feature an element of mirror. This is a visual artifact, something similar to a film grain or uneven texture visible on the display. However, in my opinion, the amount of mirror is within tolerances and unless you know what you're looking for, you probably would never notice it. We'll start with what is most likely to be the most popular out of all the three options. That's the 50 PPD version, realizable FOV for me, was a very respectable 126 horizontal and 100 vertical. And in Microsoft Flight Simulator, it showed a whooping 6240 by 6280 pixels. The 50 PPD version, in my opinion, offers a very balanced mix of FOV and display resolutions. The headset is bright, colors are very good indeed, and the clarity and sharpness of the image, well, it's a joy to behold. The stereo or binocular overlap is just right, in my opinion, meaning for most that you won't suffer from any eye strain. There are hints of chromatic aberration every now and again, particularly when looking down. The sweet spot in the headset is large enough for you to comfortably find it. The aspheric lenses are not edge-to-edge -edge clarity. There is a slight drop-off in terms of resolution, a little bit of distortion right at the very periphery of your view. However, the amount of real estate affected by this is nominal and doesn't detract in any way from the headset's enjoyment. In my individual reviews, I cover over the performance requirements to push this many pixels through the headset, so I'm not going to cover them again here. But it is a point of note. I've been quite comfortable in this headset for fairly long VR sessions, lasting up to 2.5 to 3.5 hours. Let's now move on to option number 2, which is ultra-wide. For me, horizontal FOV increased from 126 to 134, and vertical FOV decreased from 100 to 96. By and large, this headset is exactly the same as the one we've just looked at. It also features 50 PPD, obviously has a slightly different distortion profile. However, the primary difference is they have changed the stereo or binocular overlap. They have reduced it slightly, thus increasing the horizontal FOV by between 8 and 10%. Now that increase in FOV may seem marginal at best, but once in the headset it is noticeable. Realizable FOV varies from person to person. Some have reported an improvement in FOV of up to about 138 degrees. My results, as mentioned earlier, was 134 degrees. The big advantage, in my opinion, of a wide FOV, of course, is that increased sense of immersion, being there, and speed. The characteristics, features and functions of the ultra-wide are very much the same as the 50 PPD version, although I did have to play around with the IPD settings for myself to find the most comfortable position. To accommodate the wide FOV, they've effectively stretched the image, but the resolution is so high that it's not really noticeable, and the clarity and sharpness remains largely unchanged. 
Everybody reacts differently depending on their various sensitivities. Personally, I was conscious at times of the change in the binocular overlap. And if you are sensitive to motion sickness or VR sickness, then the 50 PPD option may be the better choice for you. Our third option, of course, is the 57 PPD module. And although also again using aspheric lenses, these are very different indeed. It features a considerably higher pixel density, but to accommodate this, the FOVs had to be reduced substantially, resulting in an FOV something similar to the Quest 3, for example. And although in Microsoft Flight Simulator it renders at a resolution that's some 30% lower than the other two options, the image displayed is incredibly sharp and clear. Ideal for those that want to see every detail within the cockpit, the visuals in this headset are stunning. By being able to render the images with such clarity at a lower resolution comes with a bonus, and that bonus is performance. The increase in FPS can be anything from 35 to 50%. Subject to your system, of course. Text is clearer and sharper, although the chromatic aberration is a little bit more evident. The lenses themselves are slightly smaller and the sweet spot is smaller as well. I personally found the binocular overlap of these probably the best of the three, and I've been quite comfortable doing long sessions with this 57 PPD optical engine. With these lenses, there is a distortion at the very periphery of your view, but once again, it doesn't detract from the overall enjoyment. If you can live with a small FOV, while the image clarity and sharpness is unparalleled, in my opinion, Particularly noticeable when it comes to reading that small text, marvelling at the detail of the graphics. Before I turn to my summary of the three options available, Pimax are currently running a promotion, an optical engine giveaway campaign. That is, if you do buy a Pimax Crystal Super, between now and the end of November, enter this giveaway campaign with the opportunity of getting another optical engine at a 50% discount. If interested, link in the notes below. And also below is an affiliated link that offers you a small 3% discount and earns revenue for the channel as well. Your support and assistance is always welcome. As a portion of the channel's earnings, as well as a voluntary contribution from Pimax, goes to support some very worthy causes. So let's now turn to my personal views and opinions on the three optical engines. The one good thing, arguably, is there's no bad choices. All of them deliver and do exactly what they promise to do. The most popular is going to be the standard 50 PPD version, and that's because it offers a really good balance between FOV, visual clarity, resolution, and so on. It is very much just hitting that sweet spot for most people. The ultra wide will appeal to those that are looking for just that little extra element of immersion with the wider FOV, that sense of speed, perhaps dogfighting in DCS, that type of thing. And the 57 PPD version, which is my personal favorite and my current go to, yes, there's a big penalty in terms of the FOV, but I'm not overly sensitive to that anyway. But that clarity and that boost in performance is very, very important. So for those that are struggling for all performance, don't have the very top end CPU or GPU, the 57 PPD could well be a great option to get you up and running with the high end visuals and yet performance friendly. And then, of course, there is the pending OLED. Now, that optical engine isn't quite available at the moment. It'll be very interesting to see what, how that performs. It's likely to have the best visuals out of all of them. FOV, I'm not quite sure on at this time, but it'll certainly be more expensive, I would imagine. So we have to take that into consideration. Whether or not you want to wait for the OLED or whether you want to plumb for the QLED options that are currently available. Well, I hope you found this useful and informative. Till next time, stay well, look after yourself, see you again soon, and ciao for now, Captains.